Good afternoon. Welcome to the Coffee Conversation hosted by the Hugh Lane Gallery on the 5th of August 2020. Today we will be looking at a masterpiece by French artist Eugène Boudon. This work at the seaside has been part of the collection for over 100 years and it is a very good example of one of the many paintings he completed at the popular beach resorts in northern France. It also gives a good indication of why Boudin was so important in the creation of Impressionism and the entire birth of modern art. I'm going to minimize myself now so you can enjoy the art, but you'll still be able to hear me as we talk about the paintings. 19th century France was brimming with revolutionary artists. But Eugène Boudin holds a special place in the history of art as one of the precursors to Impressionism and the birth of modern art. While he is perhaps best known today as a teacher of Claude Monet, Boudin instilled an unrivaled sense of life and energy into thousands of paintings and sketches he completed over his life. Uh, the poet and critic Charles Baudelaire once described Boudin as a painter of the magic of air and water. And Boudin believed in painting out in the open air, on plain air, directly from nature. Even saying once that anything painted directly from nature and on the spot has always a force, power and vivacity of touch that one cannot find in the studio. His work certainly reflects that philosophy, and it's clear to see why his work influenced the Impressionists. He painted scenes along the entire Atlantic coast, from Holland to Bordeaux, painting beaches, ports, fishermen, tourists. But it is taught that his finest and most characteristic works were from the beaches of Trouvaille and Dolieu which is a setting of the painting we'll be looking at today. It was here <clears throat> that a large series of paintings, he managed to capture the, the beauty of nature and the everyday life of the middle class visitors to the beach in perfect harmony with one another. Eugene Louis Boudon was born on July 12th, 1824, in Honfleur, France. Both his mother and father made a living in the maritime community. His father was a captain and his mother worked as a stewardess. His father owned a boat, the Ponichnel, which Eugene began working on as a cabin boy alongside his father around the age of 10. Eugene began, uh, Baudin began his first drawings aboard this boat sketching in the actual margins of his books. He did not stay long aboard the ship as he nearly drowned, but this period of time very likely left its influence in his lifelong fascination with the sea, as did his childhood spent among the hosts of Normandy. According to those who knew him, Boudin apparently preserved to his last days much of a sailor's character, frankness, accessibility, and open-heartedness. In 1835, his family moved to La Havre, where his father established himself as a stationer and frame maker. <clears throat> when Boudin was about 11 or 12, he began working for the printer Joseph Morlan, and then shortly after with uh, Alphonse Lamay at a stationery shop. In Le Havre. La Malay became Boudin's first patron, noticing his interest in drawing and purchasing Boudin his first set of paints. Boudin worked at the stationery shop with La Malay until the end of his teenage years, at which point he left to set up his own business with a man named Jean Haché. Boudin and Haché opened their stationery shop of their own in 1844 
and it soon transformed into a gathering spot for local artists. There, they, saw, they sold not only supplies, but also provided an exhibition space for artists, becoming something of a local gallery. Through it, Boudin was able to experience for the first time the life of an artist. It enabled him to come into contact with several very influ influential artists, such as Constant Troyon, Thomas Couture, Eugene Isabey, all who encouraged him to pursue his own artistic endeavors and his, whose influence is visible in his very early work. He also met Jean-Francois Millet, who gave him valuable advice. And all of these artists would leave their mark on Boudin and contributed to his decision to become a full-time artist. He sold off his share of the business in order to pay for another person to take his military conscription. From that moment on, Boudin focused his career on being an artist. The early years as an artist proved difficult for Boudin. He often found himself working dawn until dusk, making art around everything he saw and experimenting with whatever mediums were available, such as pastels, watercolors, drawings, paintings. Uh, for those early years, he sold flower paintings and still lives, similar to the one we see here, in order to make ends meet and save enough money to travel to Paris. Boudin traveled extensively over the course of his life, visiting Belgium, Holland, and Venice, as well as large parts of France. This penchant for traveling began in 1845, when he took a short trip to Paris, where he studied the old masters and made copies from the Louvre. In 1849, he accompanied the sculptor Louis Rocher to raise funds to benefit artists. And this allowed him to visit the Belgian museums and to study Dutch masters, notably landscape and marine painters such as Willem van der Velde, Jacob de Rusdael, and Paulus Potter. This time studying at the Louvre and now his experiences traveling through the regions of northern France and Belgium meant that he was exposed to both the modern and past traditions of art, a visual education that would serve him over his entire career as an artist. This is in spite of the fact he never really had any formal artistic training. Once he returned to La Havre, Boudin began exhibiting at local exhibitions and made his public debut in 1850 at the exhibition of the Society des Amis des Arts in La Havre. The purchasing committee of the Society bought two of his works and were so impressed with Boudin's potential that the chairman of the city council of Le Havre recommended that Boudin be considered for a travel grant. He managed to receive more recommendations from other artists, such as Constant Truon, who had met him in his time at the stationery store, and was awarded a three-year study grant to continue his work in Paris. Boudin, however, he felt Paris offered him little as an artist, and would spend most of his time outside of Paris, trying to escape the claustrophobian, the claustrophobic Parisian life, as he called it. Instead, traveling between La Havre, Honfleur, Rouen, and other parts of Normandy. He did keep a studio in Paris for the winter months from about 1850 onwards, during which time he used the watercolors, drawings, and oil sketches he had made from life to create completed artworks. Boudin worked directly from nature and immersed himself in it whenever he could. He once said that three strokes of a brush made directly from nature were worth more than three days laboring at the easel. And he always tried to retain the freshness and spontaneity 
in his finished works. He painted ports, country scenes, animals, still lives, and his favorite subject would become the fashionable beach spots in Doiville and Treval. <clears throat> Often, even though he painted people on beaches, the true subject matter would be the sea air and how it affected the clouds, sea, and people on the beaches. Boudin's seascapes were praised by his contemporaries, especially beloved were his skies. However, Boudin also painted some inland landscapes and a long series of still lifes, which com culminated in the decorative panels of fruits, flowers, and birds, painted in 1869 for the Chateau de Bourdainville, and which we can see a section of here on our presentation. It was in 1859, however, that Boudin's Pardon of Sainte Anne au Plante was accepted as a Paris salon marking his debut on the official art scene and the end of his formative years as an artist. <clears throat> Boudin visited Brittany for the first time in 1855 and traveled there regularly as he was interested in capturing the way of life of the peasants in the region. It was during his second visit in 1857 that he attended the Paradon of saint anne la Prelade, one of the region's biggest and most popular religious celebrations where he made numerous sketches of the event. He chose to focus on the secular, more communal aspect of the celebration for the finished piece and shows the crowd working in the countryside, preparing a picnic for the pilgrims. At the Salon, the city of La Havre purchased a painting in 1860 for 500 francs, a significant amount considering that still lives and landscapes could be negotiated for about <clears throat> 50 francs or so at the time. However, as I've mentioned, Baudin is best known for his paintings of the beaches of Normandy and Brittany, where the natural elements of the sea and sky dominate the painting, often the warping the people, vi the people visible. Boudin painted his first, his first beach scenes around 1860, prompted by his friend Ferdinand Martin, and on the advice of another friend, Eugene Isabey, he traveled to Travail and Deauville to work with the beach resorts from 1862. These towns are becoming more popular in recent years with leisure activities like casinos and racetracks available as well as splendid beaches. They had even been visited by Empress Eugenie and her court, which only increased the popularity of these destinations. Boudin began painting his scenes there and remarked to his friend Ferdinand Martin in 1863 that they love my little ladies on the beach and some people say that there's a tread of gold to exploit there. It is very possible that Boudin viewed the production of these paintings from a mercenary point of view, at least at first. As time passed, Baudin seemed to become increasingly tired of the subject matter saying in another letter to Martin in August 1867 that he had a confession to make. The beach at Travail, which he used to find is so delightful, seemed nothing more than a frightful masquerade. Referring to the beachgoers as a group of gilded parasites with haughty airs, and that he felt shame painting such slothful idleness. He consoled himself by painting the effects of light on the scenes rather than the people themselves. However, this somewhat uh, despairing view 
other people would change soon enough. And he wrote another letter to Martin in 1868, arguing now that the peasants have their painters, but between you and me, the bourgeois walking along the jetty towards the sunset has just as much right to be caught on camera, to be brought to the light. They too are often resting after a hard day's work. These people who come out from their offices and from behind their desks. If there are a few parasites among them, aren't there also people who have carried out their allotted labor? There's a serious and irrefutable argument. From then on, Baudin deliberately painted middle-class people in his works as other artists like Millet had chosen to champion peasants and working-class people. He painted these resorts with animation and lively energy, creating art that was avant-garde merely through its depiction of contemporaneous people. Even though he worked on plein air, Baudin would always create a large number of sketches, often focusing on the variation of dress, uh, changes in weather and the sky, effects of the environment and weather. This watercolor sketch, for instance, evokes the essence of these beachgoers in a very quick, extremely painterly manner. We can see what are possibly nannies or governesses in red and black uniforms, watching over groups of children. You can, you can really get a sense of the speed that Boudin produced this sketch, trying to capture the scene as quickly as he could, sketching first with a few quick strokes of black pencil and graphite, and then following it with a very fluid application of watercolor. Boudin would eventually stop painting scenes of fashionable men and women on the beach in the late 1960s. However, from then he would focus his energies on the depictions of the sky, boats and animals. His style of painting did change, with his early work focusing on outdoor creation, beachgoers, while his work by the 1890s, like we see here, while depicting the same subject matter, the focus has now become much more on the size of the space, the massive seashores, the endless skies, the vast beauty of nature. Between 1860 and 1896, Boudin painted nearly 300 paintings of these beaches and beachgoers, referred to some as crinoline beaches. At the seaside, the painting in the Hugh Lane Gallery's collection is one of these many beach scenes created by Boudin, but is unusual in that it includes figures in the water, which you can see towards the left-hand side of the piece. The inclusion of the swimmers is even more unusual in light of the dark, brooding clouds and the strong winds that appear to be buffeting the beach. The piece was painted in 1867, right in the middle of Boudin's changing perspective uh, and feelings towards the beachgoers he painted. He had been finding these seaside resorts increasingly unattractive around that time. And he was probably painted at Trovai. And in the painting, we can see his love of cool, almost silvery light. He has these very beautiful blonde tones in the sand uh, and, and with an attribute that is really only heightened by the bright flashes of color in the flags, in the dresses, in the clothing of the beachgoers. As I said, this painting is likely painted in Travai, as we can see a very similar location in another piece by him from the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, Boudin would frequently write notes to himself about the direction of the breeze, the time of day, and the date in his drawn books and sketch pads. And this careful recording of nature can be felt in the strong wind from at the seaside, which, while invisible, is still sways and moves the ladies' hair ribbons and skirts. 
You can also see a swimmer returning to the shore wrapped in a towel, but the wind has turned so strong that it's flowing and flapping behind them. Wudans was skilled at painting sandy beaches with very glowing uh, tones, giving a very luminous quality to his work. And he always liked to add contemporary fashion as almost a contract, contrast make word, to the to the soft colors of nature. Often in these paintings, he filled his beach scenes with either beachgoers or fishermen, but they are very often dwarfed by the sand, sky, and sea. If you look at, at the seaside, the actual, uh, the actual part of the painting that contains the figures is a band of perhaps less than a fifth of the entire canvas. Everything else is either sand, sea, sand dunes, or this glorious unending sky. Uh, we can see how low the horizon is in the picture, how he's drawing our attention to dark clouds brewing. In fact, one of his contemporaries, Tristan Klingsor, wrote of Budan 1891, that where many painters only find a pretext for large surfaces of blue, Boudin astonishes us by a variety and an incomparable accuracy. Each cloud has a, has a physiognomy, give us the impression of the immensity which holds our attention. His love of nature could be a double-edged blade, however, as Boudin's fascination with nature's beauty often turned to frustration and melancholy at his inability to replicate it. He wrote in his journal once that he was tortured by her splendor. And some historians have argued that this love of nature was part of the reason that throughout his career, Boudin often failed to see the merits of his own work. That is not to say that others did not see his greatness. <clears throat> By 1859, Boudin had developed a style of painting that earned him the admiration of artists and critics. Gustave Courbet called him a seraph, an angel-like being, while Camille Corot dubbed him king of the skies. And it was Charles Baudelaire, who first met Baudin by chance while visiting his mother in La Havre. After seeing Baudin's work in the studio, he wrote a last minute addition to his Salon Review of 1859. Commenting in um, Baudin's Salon entry, the pardon of Salon Le Plot, that Baudin was among the most progressive artists working and Baudelaire became one of the first critics to recognize Baudin's talent. He noted in 1859 that Baudin had in his studio hundreds of pastel studies improvised before the sea and sky, like this piece we see here <clears throat> on the right, and that Baudin, sorry, Baudin had cut, recorded on each study the date, the time, the wind, that his depictions could be so accurate, one could cover the inscription with your hand and still be able to guess the season, the time, the wind, just by Boudin's depiction of nature. Uh, <clears throat> interesting enough, Boudin himself referred to his work in a letter as perhaps not great art, but at least a fairly honest image of the world in our time. And this captures the idea of contemporary modernism that Baudelaire would elaborate on in his essay, The Painter of Modern, of Modern Life. Baudelaire believed one must capture things as they are now, not the past distilled through art uh, via classical imagery, but the present time in which we all live with all of its modernity. Eugene Baudin would also play a very serious formative role in the development of Claude Monet's art, introducing him 
to contemporary painting techniques like en plein air painting, the style of painting that Monet uh, would then use uh, throughout his entire life. Monet even once said, if I have become a painter, I owe it to Jean Baudin. This is one of the major reasons that Boudin has been referred to as a precursor of Impressionism, a pioneer to one of the uh, early births of modern art. It was in a stationery shop that Baudin met a teenage Claude Monet. Uh, that same stationery shop had been showing caricatures by Monet in the years 1856 and 57. And according to Monet, Baudin came up to him in the store and told him how he always enjoyed his caricatures, and, but he hoped that he wouldn't stop there. Baudin advised Monet to study, learn, to see, to paint, draw, make landscapes. And although Monet initially resisted, <clears throat> he eventually agreed to join Baudin and paint with him in 1858. And as Monet painted with Baudin, he watched him warily at first, and then more attentively. Uh, and as he said, it was as if a veil had been torn from my eyes. Baudin's absorption of his work and his independence were enough to decide the future and development of my painting. So, Serious had Baudin's effect been upon Monet uh, that his that Baudin's style of painting, born from mimicking flickering light, which evolved the use of numerous touches of color in short brush strokes, this would be revolutionary to Monet in helping him develop the style that he became world famous for. Towards the end of the 1860s. Boudin would insist on bourgeoisie visitors to the seaside deserving the same right he painted as the working class people of Millet and Corbeil. This desire to show ordinary people as they were and not in an idealized manner was part of the ideological foundation of the Impressionist paintings of modern life. Not only that but Boudin's love of painting outdoors, his energy and movement in his paintings of contemporary scenes, these were all attributes he shared with the burgeoning impress Impressionist movement. So it seems proper that Boudin should exhibit at the first Impressionist exhibition at the studio of the photographer Nader in 1874. Monet was the one who was personally responsible for inviting Boudin to exhibit with the Impressionists in their first show. And at the exhibition, Boudin submitted two canvases, several pastels and watercolors. But at the same time, he exhibited two works at the Parisian Salon, which was in violation of the Impressionist rule not to exhibit there. One historian even remarks that this was an important moment, showing the links between the past and future directions of French art, with Baudin being simultaneously present at the avant-garde exhibition and at the Salon, a sign of his acceptance across the art world. In the end, Baudin chose to only participate in the first Impressionist exhibition, preferring to continue to submit to the official Salon. While he did share many of the attributes of the Impressionist painters, he never devoted himself to their ideologies or used the vibrant paints or optical color effects that they so preferred. But in spite of all this monumental influence on French art and his role in uh, the birth of a new style of painting, Baudin would struggle financially for many years. It was not until the end of the 1860s that Boudin would become more widely recognized with his growing reputation enabling him to travel in the 1870s. He would stage his own auctions in La Havre and Paris as means of making money, 
but these were of limited success. That would all change, however, in the 1880s, when Boudin formed a professional relationship with the famed art dealer Paul de Rouen, who, which would prove incredibly fruitful. In 1883, Durand Ruel opened his new gallery on the Boulevard de la Madeleine in Paris with an exhibition of works by Boudin, comprising of over 150 paintings and pastel drawings. Um, in a telling note to Boudin's avant garde leadings, Durand Ruel was also the art dealer of many of the Impressionists. Boudin also began to see, receive official recognition, being awarded a third place medal in the Paris Salon of 1881 for Le Musée Rotterdam, the painting we see right now, which is in the Musée d'Orsay. He also received a second class medal in 1883 and a gold medal in the 1889 Exposition Universelle, all of which only generated more interest in his work. After so many years of struggle, success came so rapidly that Boudin recounted in his journal that 1881 was the year that marked the beginning of an official interest in Boudin. In these later years, his works were in constant demand, but he no longer had the energy to produce as he, as he had once, even noting that I exhaust myself terribly to content the world. He was made a chevalier, a chevalier, a knight of the Legion of Honor in 1892, as well as elected a member of the, of the Society des Beaux Arts in 1890. Sadly, as Boudin grew older, he was affected by facial neuralgia, which would hinder him for the rest of his life. And it has been suggested that this condition was caused by exposure from harsh weather from countless painting trips. Due to his health, he was encouraged to spend his winters in the south of France on the Côte d'Azur. And towards the end of his life, he began to experiment with new ways of painting, deliberately leaving his paintings with a sketch-like quality, such as in this work, Boats and Breakwater, or from the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Le Havre. These last works show how radical a transformation he underwent, as he seems to almost move towards abstraction in some of his pieces. The painting's subject is now less important than ever. The focus is on the brushstrokes, the color, the sense of movement of the paint. Sadly, his wife passed away in 1889, and it was in traveling and painting that he managed to cope with her loss. Traveling to Venice several times, as with, and eventually turning to the north of France to resume painting. He died at his home in Deauville in 1898, on August 8th, most likely from stomach cancer. Throughout his career, Baudin made bright, lively pastel drawings he completed hundreds of studies of the sky and clouds, producing over 4,000 paintings and 7,000 drawings, pastels and watercolors. Many of his works can be found at the Musée Eugène Boudin in Honfleur, as well as works in the Musée d'Orsay and the Museum of Modern Art in Le Havre the Louvre, in fact, that great museum where Boudin had once copied from old masters, now possesses the largest collection of Boudin's watercolors, pastels and drawings in the world. But even with the enormous body of work, it is in paintings like At the Seaside that we see Boudin's true passion and skill, his love of nature and the place that people have among it. He is remembered today as, as an early pioneer of one of the great movements in art, but his skill, his love is always visible in, the, in his work on the Normandy beaches. Even saying to his brother that, I, will, I shall do other things, 
but I will always be a painter of beaches. I'd like to thank you all for joining me for a talk today. If you want any further details about the Hugh Lane Gallery's programs, please see the website and I hope to see you again for future coffee conversations. Have a lovely day.